As you get settled, let me encourage you to open a Bible with me back to the book of Acts, chapter 17, where we will read together in just a few moments. Thank you so much for enthusiastically singing out with us. It is a beautiful morning that we have been blessed with to gather together as sons and daughters of God. We want to open up God's Word, and we want to hear from God, because that is what matters most. There isn't anything that we will do or accomplish or acquire this week that is more significant than hearing from God. He has spoken, His will has been revealed and recorded and preserved for us, and it is a treasure, a blessing to be able to hear from Him this morning. In Acts chapter 17, we're jumping into the middle of a flowing account of Acts of the Apostles. These were men who had walked with Jesus, men who had seen Jesus, men whose hearts had been captivated by Jesus. And now, by commission of Jesus, they are going into all the world and they're proclaiming good news of redemption because God's Son had come and died for the sins of all humanity. He had not only died and been buried, but He had been raised from the dead. Three days later, He had appeared, and for weeks He had appeared to hundreds and hundreds of people. He had ascended back to His Father in heaven with the promise to return, but in the meantime, there was news of redemption and forgiveness and purpose and hope that all men everywhere needed to hear. This book, the book of Acts, is the story of these men going into all the world and proclaiming this news and the hearts of men and women all over the place being captivated by that. Churches of believers being founded all over the Jewish and the Gentile world. We jump right into the middle of that story. We're following a man named Paul and Silas through whom God has been doing amazing things. They're fresh off of spending time in a Philippian jail. And a great earthquake occurring and setting them free. And the jailer, the, the very man who was guarding them, his heart being melted and him being moved to ask, what must I do to be saved? Now Paul and Silas are traveling a little further. Luke is the one who is telling us this story. And he tells us in Acts chapter 17 and verse 1. Now when they, Paul and Silas, had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews, a place where Jews would gather and pray and read the law of Moses together. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on Three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Some of them were persuaded. And joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous. And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. 
And when they arrived, Paul and Silas went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews, Luke tells us, were more noble. Literally, they were more admirable. They were more honorable. They were more excellent than those in Thessalonica. Why is that? It's not because they were more well-off. It's not because they had great estates out in the countryside. It's not because they had titles that were associated with themselves or their family name. It wasn't because of all of the wealth that they had at home. No, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they received the word with all eagerness. Examining the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing, as well as men. Let me invite you to open your Bible with me back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, where we'll be reading in just a few moments. As Paul mentioned, we have just come off of a truly excellent week. I don't know about you, but for me, it it was a time of refreshment and and focus and our minds and our bodies to some degree, those of us who were here every week, are are a little worn down just from working throughout the day and focusing on these great things at night. But it's worth it. It's been a wonderful week and we've been guided in a, a great study of God's Word. Brian used the Scriptures to show us the more excellent way of love. Now what? Do we just close the book on that week and every once in a while remark at what a great week it was and what a powerful speaker Brian is and and how much our children enjoyed being down the hallway and learning the same sorts of things on their own age level? Now what? Do we just look back with fond memories at that week that we shared together? Or is there something more that we ought to be doing? Could I encourage you to pay special attention to what we're being told about these people? They were ordinary men and women just like you and just like me. They lived in an ordinary city nearly 2,000 years ago. But there was something about them that when God looked at them, was commendable. This was excellent. This was noble. This was admirable. This was honorable. I don't know about you, but I want to be that sort of a hearer of God's Word. I want to be that sort of a learner, an applier of God's Word. But that doesn't happen by accident. What does it take to learn like those people in Berea learned? I would suggest to you, first of all, that it demands that we interact with what matters most, that we interact with what God has said. There are all sorts of things that someone could stand on this stage and talk about and lead our minds in and and lead discussions in. But the reason that these people were commended is that they were interacting with what mattered most. And they were interacting with it in the way that was most commendable. They appreciated that God had spoken in the Scriptures. They appreciated that someone had come and was seeking to reason with them from the Scriptures. And they were interested and eager to do that. Could I encourage you, when it comes to times together like this, to interact with teaching and preaching with an open Bible? Why? 
In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul, as he writes now to young Timothy and describes what God has done in this book, says in 2 Timothy 3, 16, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I charge you, therefore, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. God is the one worth listening to. God has spoken. God continues to speak by his Word. I encourage you, just from a practical point of view, if you're using a physical, tangible Bible, to open it up. If you're following along on some device, to open that app up and and to be ready and eager to follow along because these are God's words. When we open up this book, we're acknowledging God is worth listening to. And this is where he has spoken. Open your Bible with me back to the book of Psalms, back to Psalm 119. How do we learn like the Bereans learned? Very evidently from what Luke is telling us in Acts chapter 17, they didn't close the book on what Paul had to say and just go about with the rest of their life. You want to learn like the Bereans? Don't close the book on teaching and preaching and then rush on to the rest of your life. Psalm 119, you read with me beginning in verse 9. The question is asked, how can a young man keep his way pure? It's going to take more than simply hearing with a bunch of other people and then leaving behind what he has heard, what she has heard, and then going out and just living life in whatever way comes most naturally. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wonder from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. The Bereans were interested in hearing what their Creator had to say and storing it up in their hearts. Psalm 119, verse 15. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will will not forget your word. Same chapter, verse 27. Make me understand the way of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous works. Verse 148. My eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promise. I don't just hear, I don't just open my Bible and and look up and down at the right times and hear what is uh, being talked about and acknowledge, yeah, that sounds pretty good, and then go out and live the rest of my life. No, I take those things. And if God is worth listening to, I treasure them up in my heart that God might do the work He wants to do in my life. The older more mature that we get, the more we realize that that work of God in our lives, more often than not, is very slow, very subtle, very progressive. God's work in our hearts is much more like a crock pot than a microwave. We, Brian talked earlier this week about how, how much we love instant gratification, but everybody knows better to have a slow-cooked, tender pot roast than a hot pocket, right? We understand that even though some things take time, there's work going on there. 
And that work is worth it. God can work in and on our hearts. But we've got to do the work of getting it in our minds and treasuring it up in our hearts. Meditating on what we have read. That's one of the things that Mary, even at a very young age, is commended for. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 2 and verse 19, she hears extraordinary things, but she treasures them up pondering them in her heart. That's what those Bereans in Acts chapter 17 were doing. Open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Mark chapter 4 where we will read in just a moment. You want to learn like the Bereans learned? Allow the Scriptures to shape your everyday life. To be shaped a little more as a way of life. Because we have been told by God's Son, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus' perhaps most famous parable in Mark chapter 4 and verse 3, he begins by saying, listen. Mark 4 verse 3, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. And then he says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Why is that? Because the seed continues to be sown and the only variable is what sort of heart is that seed falling on? And the reality of that variable is no one is responsible for the condition of the soil of my heart other than me. Your heart is going to be impacted this week. Can I ask a hard question? What will my heart most consistently naturally, eagerly gravitate towards. My heart will be shaped by Facebook perhaps this week. Cable television this week. Keeping up with all of the things that are going on around me. Keeping up with really important updates online like what he had for lunch and the latest cat video and things like that. <coughs> things that really matter, right? No one is responsible for my heart but me. What will I do Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday to whet my appetite for next Lord's Day? I would suggest to you my appetite next Lord's Day will very much be determined by what I feed myself tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, so on. You turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Acts chapter 17 where once again we notice carefully the, the description of these people. You want to learn like the Bereans? approach opportunities to learn from the Scriptures with eagerness. There were some in Bible days who were very eager, but eager for the wrong things, the wrong reasons. We're told in, in Luke 11, for instance, verse 53, that Jesus went away from there and there were scribes and Pharisees that began to press Him hard and to provoke Him to speak about many things, lying in wait for Him to catch Him in something He might say. And they were, as far as society was concerned, the real religious, respectable, noble people. Not so fast. What did we read in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11? No, there were ordinary Jews who didn't live in the capital of Judaism. They didn't live in the shadow of the temple itself in Jerusalem. 
But they were more noble than those in Thessalonica and many of them in, in Jerusalem because they received the word with all eagerness. God is speaking. And what is more pressing or important than that? You want to learn like the Bereans? Prepare yourself to examine the Scriptures. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 8 and verse 18, Jesus said, Take care how you hear. It's one thing for uh, my, my eardrums to be vibrating because I hear physically something Take care how you hear. What are you bringing to the table? Even in the days of Jesus, there was give and take. There was broadcast and there was reception. And we understand for messages to be conveyed, both have got to be doing their part, just like a pitcher and a catcher in a baseball game. A pitcher can throw the best pitch imaginable, but if there's nobody there to catch it, or if the catcher is there, but what is being pitched isn't worth catching, what difference does it make? Both are necessary. Jesus delivered the words of life, and then he told people, now you take care how you hear. Paul and Silas are going all over the Gentile world, and they're reasoning from the Scriptures of God himself. Jesus is the Christ, and that means something for your life and for my life. Some were willing to receive, and some weren't. But here's the bottom line. We take care how we hear, because to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he thinks that he has will be taken away. How's my heart? No one is responsible for that other than me. Prepare yourself to examine the Scriptures. Get the rest that God created you to need in order that you're ready to hear from God. Get here on time. Get settled. Get focused. Pray about your heart. Could I humbly ask that you would pray for those who, who teach and preach? The Apostle Paul taught, taught those in Ephesus and asked them in Ephesus that they would be praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, he says, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. You open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You want to learn like the Bereans? Be confident that you can learn. That you can discover. You can study. You can understand God's revealed truth. There were those in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12, who were boldly saying, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. And that leads Paul in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 3 to say, I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men but in the power of God you work to develop that faith he says in the third chapter of the same letter verse 5 what then is Apollos what is Paul servants through whom you believe as the Lord assigned to each I planted Apollos watered but God gave the growth now it's a question of am I willing to do the work that I need to do to discover and to study and understand what God has said. We've got this incredible statement from Paul himself in Ephesians 3 to ordinary men and women once again. 
when you read this, you can perceive. You can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. Go back with me, if you will, to the Old Testament book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 very quickly. You want to learn like the Bereans? Recognize that some things which claim to be from God are not. In 1 Kings chapter 13 in the Old Testament, we read about wicked King Jeroboam who is asserting his rule far away from the will of God. And there is a man of God, presumably from the context, a younger man of God, who goes and he boldly stands up before Jeroboam and says, this is not Right, and at first Jeroboam seeks to eliminate him and he can't do that. And so now he's going to try and bribe this man of God. The king in 1 Kings chapter 13 and verse 7 says to this man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself and I will give you a reward. And I want you to notice what the man of God says. If you give me half your house, I will not go in with you. And I will not eat bread or drink water in this place. Why was that? It was commanded me by the word of the Lord saying, You shall neither eat bread nor drink water nor return by the way that you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way that he came to Bethel. Now, an old prophet lived in Bethel. And his sons came and told him all that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told to their father the words that he had spoken to the king. And the father said to them, which way did he go? And his sons showed him the way that the man of God who came from Judah had gone. And he said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him and he mounted it and he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And he said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? I am. Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with you or go in with you, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, you shall neither eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by the way that you came. And he said, I also am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, Bring him back with you into your house that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied. The man of God goes with him. Verse 23, after he had eaten bread and drunk, he saddled the donkey for the prophet whom he had brought back. And as he went away, a lion met him on the road and killed him. I'd suggest to you that that is recorded for us for a reason. Recognize that some things which claim to be from God are not. God told us that would be the case. The Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit because there are liars. Test the Spirit to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Test teaching. Test teaching that surprises or disrupts or challenges your understanding before you swallow it. Is this from God? Can it be shown that this is from God? Perhaps it disrupts and it challenges and it surprises me. But my first reaction is just to discard it because I've never done that before. I've never thought about that before. 
You remember the example of Apollos in Acts chapter 18 and verse 24. A native of Alexandria who came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit. He spoke and he taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explain to him the way of God more accurately. He goes across to Achaia and the brothers encourage him and they ride to the disciples to welcome them. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. Beware the person who tells you they've never changed their mind. Beware the person who tells you they've never had to correct themselves. Ask Paul. Ask Peter. Ask the Bereans, who undoubtedly those Jews would have been surprised to learn that the long-awaited Christ had in fact died and been raised from the dead. Ask the Jews who believed for so very long that they knew exactly what God was going to do and exactly what they needed to do. When we hear teaching about God, things concerning God. Compare them with the Scriptures. Be humble enough to take God at His word, no matter who you are. Those Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees that we referenced earlier, pride was keeping them from listening. Pride was keeping them from believing. Pride was keeping them from applying, which is why James says in James 1 and verse 21, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. This is how we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Because we're giving the scriptures the final say. As the revealed will of the ultimate authority. There will be times when I discover that I was mistaken. There will be times that I discover that the word of God is hurting me cutting me. I would suggest to you that is by God's design. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from His sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. There are times when His Word will cut. Because the great physician knows that is what I need. Not one of us enjoys even the thought of surgery. But we trust that the surgeon knows what he or she is doing. Not one of us enjoys being metaphorically cut by a close friend who is willing to hold us accountable. But when we're mature, we realize I needed that. God is not afraid to cut for good. Our littlest children down the hall this morning talked about Simeon in Luke chapter 2. A very old man who blesses Mary when Jesus is just days old and foretells by prophecy from God. This child is appointed for the fall and the rising of many Israel in Israel and for a sign that is opposed 
and a sword will pierce your own soul also. Let's appreciate what has happened in history in order that we might be here this morning. And it may be that you know you're not right with the God behind this book. In Acts chapter 2, people came face to face with that. They were cut to the heart. And they were willing to ask, brothers, what shall we do? They were told in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you need to do that? even this very morning. Children of God are sometimes cut for good. We think of Simon in Acts chapter 8 who comes face to face with just how self-centered he really is. And he's told by Peter, it's time to repent of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. Do you need to do that this morning? You can leave this place having the same sort of commendation that those people in Berea nearly 2,000 years ago had. They heard and they examined the scriptures eagerly. They took it with them to make sure They understood exactly what God wanted them to do. If you're ready and willing to respond to our Lord and Savior, even this morning, he continues to call through the gospel. If we can help you in answering that call, would you come to the front while we stand and sing?